we knew you would come back to us to this our 309th episode of this our show human humane architecture on think tech why and you are the accumulated viewer which you see down there if you michael thankfully always put it up somewhere in the 17000s and this happens to be our eighth time that we're looking back at lahaina already membering Lahaina, as we call it, because you, DeSoto Brown, from your Bishop Museum, uh, where you work as a historian, hi, DeSoto. Good day, everyone. Um, you know, you have been, um, again, um, uh, introducing us to begin with to the history of Lahaina. And then also you went out there to show its current situation, which is unfortunately all leveled by the fire. And then with uh, you, Martin Ansolini. Hi, welcome back. Hello. Um, you will help us to get the spirits back up again because of some interesting suggestions here, how to rebuild. So we're back to that. And uh, let's start again having the shows, uh, the, the, all the images running through as we're already doing. So thanks, Michael, for that. And for you, the audience, they're numbered at the top left. So whenever you want to go back, and you want to rewatch the show and slides we're referring to, you just you look at the number at the very top left. So which will, which will run through towards the end more, but I want to talk about what you will see on slide 42, 43, and 44. And this is getting us back to something to sort of in our front yard, which is uh, Rainbow Drive and particularly the new canopy that they have been building that Jim Gisakuma, who's uh, the founder of Rainbow Drive, has been building there. And it's actually, uh, until now, people might say, well, do you have anything to show that's anywhere close to what you guys are suggesting? And I throw this out for discussion. Why is Rainbow Drive pretty close, guys? And DeSoto, you especially, because it's in your front yard, as it's also my front yard. That, I, by the way, you said kindly, I look much better. That's why I basically got out of my closet bathroom, which seemed to be uh, the lighting too bad. And now I'm, thanks to my school, on a new computer. And I'm here in the, uh, which is a uh, bedroom and uh, also kitchen and also living room and also studio all at the same time, which is also going the direction, Martine, you are going. But this is still too hermeticized and to, um, I guess, territorialize that you will break free even more. But DeSoto, how about explain to everyone, uh, which you, the audience, will then see on 42, a little bit what that new uh, canopy is down there in your hood. Well, Rainbow Drive-In has been in business for a great many years, since the 1960s. And obviously, when it was built, it was certainly not forward-looking with any type of modern technology, because we didn't have solar technology at the time that it was built, but it has remained, even while many other drive-in restaurants have gone out of business and they're no longer popular, Rainbow Drive-In has retained a great following for its very good food. And what it has built to modernize itself in the 21st century is a canopy that we see in a number of other places now, in which you use the canopy not only to shade people and park cars underneath it but more importantly it is covered with solar panels so those photovoltaic panels are generating electricity and again this is something which is more increasingly done now over parking lots that are for example at the university of hawaii system they're doing that but basically it again is a simple structure that is fulfilling two things it's providing shade from solar radiation, which we need, but which are, causes heat, causes uh, deterioration of objects, and also causes us humans to have our flesh deteriorate, unfortunately, over the long term. But not only are you providing shade, as I said, you're providing the generation of electricity as well. So the business that has this or the organization that has this type of uh, structure is actually creating its own electricity. And that's something that we want to do all over the place as much as possible. We are bathed in sunshine. We get very strong sunshine here, 20 degrees north of the equator. And we should be using that sunshine energy to give us energy for the things that we want to do. So bravo to Rainbow Drive-In for being as modern and forward as it is. And that's slide 42 again, if we can bring this back. 
Martin, uh, Martin, did we in the busy school that we're making you do, did, did, you, did we give you any time to have seen it in real yet or yet to come? Yes, 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 yes. Uh, actually, I knew it since I, before coming here, a, a taxi driver in Denver <laughs> told me that I must go to Rainbow Drive. That is, was the best place to go in Hawaii. Wow. Like a year See, ago or so. Jim, do you hear this? You will, because we forward this to you and uh, our great uh, colleague who is actually much better than we can ever be, Kurt Sandburn, who used to be our main architectural critic on the island. And we try to do our best to sort of to fill in for him. And he once reached out to me and said, Martin, what's actually the best architecture on the island? And then we agreed on, on it being that because it is so to the spot, right? And in addition to the sort of what you rightly so said, yes, it has photovoltaics on the roof, but it has it in the most fundamental way because usually you build up a roof uh, of structure, which you have here too, but then you build a roof membrane. That one you actually have to destroy and poke through again to attach the substructure for the photovoltaic panels. Well, here, and this is, again, uh, bad news for us architects as in training and being trained and accredited and being licensed, because this project that didn't need us. It just needed Jim with the idea, and he reached out to people who do it, and they all did it themselves. And they said, because they're not, you know, they're free of the Beaux-Arts BS that architects sometimes have. It just said, well, let's collapse all that into one. So actually the panels, the photovoltaic panels are actually the roof membrane as well. And here comes the point. Some, it's not absolutely tight. So sometimes when it rains, there's a little bit dripping through. But slide 49, if we can get this back, uh, DeSoto, if, if you would have your roof open in your main hall in, in Bishop Museum, uh, 49 slide, I mean, uh, yeah. Then, um, uh, you know, Don Hibbard, taught me that the missionaries were complaining that the indigenous houses actually was also not absolutely watertight. But then the thing is, why would it have to be, right? Because if you have temperate climate and you have temperature differentials and, you know, cold and warm, then you get the dew point, then you get condensation, then you get mold, all these things we don't have here. As long as the, our trade winds can breeze through, they will dry out humidity and water immediately. So that's to be considered uh, as well, right? So um, these people there that you see in 42, if we can get this back, I found it great because COVID, as we know, changed many things and the good things we had before COVID, sometimes we didn't have them back yet. So he had, if you watch the show, that show quoted up there, um, we, uh, he had it all. He had it for people, for plants, for electric charging cars, for everything and the seating Jim, unfortunately, or he's retired now, but his, you know, people and uh, never brought it back. These two uh, people here, locals, uh, father and daughter, just brought the table on their truck and put it up there. And I said, this is awesome. And I took a picture and she caught me and she said, it's only 10 bucks. I owe her great sense of humor. But on a, on a more sad note, she said, well, you know, this is, you know, where are you from? And I said, from Germany. And her dad got excited because he was stationed in Germany back then. But the, she said, well, now he's losing it. He has, you know, dementia. And uh, it was probably his lifestyle, she said, because he was on the street. He was homeless. And so we started talking. And, and she basically said, well, are you guys with Howard Hughes? And I said, well, we wish so if Howard Hughes would listen to us. But as of now, we're more on the other side, uh, only because Howard Hughes doesn't want to listen to us. And she also said, well, are you, are you for smart cities? So let's talk about smart cities a little bit, because that's a great fear of, uh, that's lingering out there and only comes through here and now then and in conspiracy theories. So let's address that a little bit, the smart city point. Martin, you want to take a stab on that one? Uh, today, the Internet of Things allows us to, to manage some systems of the city uh, in a more efficient way. And this is something that we can uh, as uh, reinforced concrete uh, allowed us 150 years ago. Now we have technology to deal some systems of the city, which is great. No? We can uh, generate uh, control water management in a more efficient way. We can control electricity 
and in energy management too, we can uh, predict uh, events such as climatic events and so on. This is great, uh, but very easily, uh, and this is already happening in, in some countries, uh, uh, it can be a, 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 almost a, a big brother effect no? on which we don't even know who's the big brother, no? uh, which is not good, which is not good because uh, when cities are, we were talking about Detroit uh, uh, on, on, on the, uh, the last session, when uh, cities are controlled by just uh, a few corporations, let's call them corporations, uh, cities uh, die when these corporations just decide uh, to go away or to, or to make them uh, die. Cities are for people, and this is not something that you can and you should not uh, want to control. So uh, smart cities should uh, help uh, make more efficient some cities, the systems of the cities, but should not pretend uh, to uh, have an overall control of, of, of what is happening. No? Uh, yeah, now it, it, for it, the uh, yeah, it could be just to add on that one. I mean, it could again be capitalism, as you said, that drives it, that runs it, that controls it, or it could be political regimes, right? I mean, it could be China. You see people on the streets here with signs up and says China is a smart city, and that's expressing their fear. And that's the daughter's fear, who, by the way, is a musician. You see on the pickup truck a huge instrument that she's playing. And so she said, you know, my dad is in the mid 60s and I'm in my you know, early 20s and I I'm afraid of all these things. And but she is then, you know, although she was suspicious of me and, you know, it's interesting once you say I'm an architect, you know, then there is some people think that's what you do. And if you look around in, in Honolulu, unfortunately, that is what architects do. Right. So we have to face that we got this bad reputation that we are complicit all these things that don't help the little people right and we go to the next slide because this is another touchy thing that here you see the other thing she said oh are you with oprah so what could she have meant the soto you want to maybe give it a guess well this whole thing has been very strange to me uh oprah winfrey and dwayne johnson are both very wealthy uh celebrities and after the Lahaina fire, they both stepped forward to start fundraising for rebuilding and for the needs of the people who've been affected. And instead of this being openly praised and them getting getting uh, good feelings out of this, people immediately said, wait a minute, you're not doing enough or you're trying to get money out of us when you've got so much money. And it, it turned into a real backlash, which I still don't quite understand. However, the, the, what we just talked about right before the show got started was, well, these two celebrities with a great deal of money, what could they do in addition to giving their own money and raising money? And one of the things that you said, Martin, was what about if they purchase property? What about if they purchase land, which can then be turned over to the individual people in Lahaina who need places to live or need to rebuild their businesses or something like that? and let those people decide what they want to do and how they want to do it. And this is the bigger question about behind this reconstruction, which is what we've been talking about. How does that occur? And how does that happen in a way that is both um, sustainable as well as what people want, the way people want to live, as well as all of the other considerations about private property, public property, um, the other things about withdrawing from the shoreline as the ocean level rises, all of those huge considerations have to come into play. And maybe we don't need celebrities directing it, but maybe we do need celebrities giving assistance to it and providing their power and their money to further those types of goals. Well, and in fact, in addition to, you know, I think you just came up with something that could be a good compromise. Because in fact, it's it's more specific because both Oprah and Dwayne actually own land in Maui. And in Oprah's case, it's sort of high up, you know, on a hill. And there's all these conspiracy things with the color blue and her blue roof and things like that. That don't, again, we said this before, they don't seem to go anywhere. 
let people who should want to investigate in that do that and then, you know, do justice. But we have to move on, we said. But again, I, I appreciate Wayne. We always did. It was, we see in the top right, because when he was still considering running for president of the United States, we were cheerleading him at the Soto a lot. And then unfortunately, he withdrew with understandably that he said, I, I want to have time for my family and my daughters. Um, but again, we wish he you know, would, would, would reconsider. And what I think would make him a great president is that he has the ability, which you know, leaders increasingly less have, is to be self-reflective. And as you know, these news here from the local news show that, that he says, well, you know, I, I didn't think about it, how it would come across when I mean well and I give a lot of money, which he has. But then it's still like people like, OK, well, but you, now you want us to give money and we can't we because we try to make ends meet and, and we can't. So maybe, you know, it has to stay with you. And, and that could be a, the great here to say, well, you guys who have the money, maybe don't have to give your land. Thanks to Soto, but land because you have enough money, you buy other land and then you give it to us and we go from there. Uh, by ourselves, for ourselves. And that is the proposition that you, Martin, have been coming up here and we continue to talk about, rightly so. But also, Dwayne, we know, didn't just wrestle himself out of his, you know, childhood that was, um, if he could have enjoyed the place more that Takashi Anbi had designed for him, when there wasn't, wouldn't have been that pressure of territorialization because he did not own that with his mother, but he rented it and uh, they were evicted because they couldn't pay for it. So if that hadn't been, we always want to go back to him and hopefully we get the chance to sort of to talk to him and explain that, that actually the building wasn't the problem, but the money that wasn't there was the problem, right? So he could now revisit the childhood, which he does, as you see him on YouTube with selfies that he makes, selfie videos. And he'll say, well, you donate with what you can, which is the money, and then you empower the people to do something. And me as, again, the previous having wrestled me out of my poverty, but now, you know, mostly known as uh, one of the most, um, you know, um, accomplished actors. And that being said, you know, um, sometimes we need to dream, you know, and, and that kind of dream, it seemed like missing. Stanley Chang's newsletter came in. Uh, and and it was reporting that now these uh, these uh, little emergency shelters that are can you know be uh, folded out uh, are shipped in from Europe. Wait a minute, I'm going back over Christmas with a bad feeling because I'm have a large fossil fuel footprint. So sorry, you know yours, Martin, can be all made from here and from scratch. Predominantly, why do we need to? ship in something else again as we do san pellegrino or we do the heavy rail mm. train that come from italy but from hungary where these elements come we have gabor who was demonstrating in kailua how to make you know quick housing that doesn't just need to stay temporary but could be permanent out of autoclave arid concrete that we know you just so are, are very excited about so you know, having dreams, having visions about the things we're talking gets us to the next slide. And uh, you, Martin, explain us. Yeah, no, um, um, first, let me uh, wrap up uh, what the Soto was saying about land, and you were talking about land, is that uh, if we are able to acquire land, uh, this land could be used just for reforesting, for example. No? So bringing water, uh, which will avoid fires, that will uh, even uh, on the forest, forest itself or uh, uh, like beside it and also bring agriculture. No? So uh, we can generate like eatable forests somehow that also can bring uh, more uh, uh, sovereignty to the, to, the, to the people of Lehigh no? during the reconstruction and afterward. Um, uh, also, maybe just start thinking about parking plots outside the built environment uh, to avoid cars to enter, like public public parking plots, if needed, because maybe probably we, people will at least tourists will not need cars to bring here to come here uh, with a good public transportation system. No, um, Martin was talking about Encanto, the 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 movie that I was uh, lucky to be advisor of. Uh, 
uh, and uh, uh, and what happened uh, with Encanto, which is uh, a beautiful, uh, let's say, uh, cinematographic uh, scenario, is that uh, everything everything was happening in a house. At, at the end of the movie, the house got destroyed, uh, as have happened many times uh, in my my native Colombia. Uh, many natural disasters. Colombia is the fourth country, more more vulnerable country uh, in terms of of natural disaster after Philippines, India, and Mexico. Um, uh, and uh, so we are very expert on rebuilding. Uh, uh, so there are some very interesting cases. Uh, and what is happening in the house is that the building was uh, made by the community. There is a beautiful world word that is called Minga. And a Minga is uh, a moment on which the whole community gets together to, re to, to do something, for example, to cultivate or to harvest, or as it happens in the movie, uh, uh, to rebuild the, the house, which is uh, kind of uh, as a very like neo-colonial house, blah, blah, also evocates a, an informal settlement of slum, which is very common also in Colombia. Uh, and, and then what it's, it is happening here is that every room is a scenario. Uh, and there is this room of Antonio, uh, on which there is this magical tree, full of 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 light. No, the the tree works as as a house. No, and we were already talking about this, uh, 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 on which uh, we have the tree, we have the hammocks, and and the tree will allow us to generate uh, different levels. No, uh, your your approach, Martin, is more about thinking about uh, uh, using this three-dimensional uh, space to, to be able to live in different levels. Uh, again, bringing back uh, the rainbow drive structure, this second ground floor could also be understood uh, uh, as, a, as a, let's say, a space for resiliency. No? As it happens, for example, in Cambodia, in Vietnam, that houses have, uh, let's say, a summer ground floor uh, and a winter ground floor. When it is the rainy season, people go up. Uh, and and this is like life is dynamic, so we can think about about uh, living in different levels depending on the moment of the day, the night when it is spread, you can go upstairs and have a barbecue or whatever. Uh, if it is fresh and cloudy, you can also go out upstairs. Uh, in the case of an emergency, for example, a flood, you cannot also go upstairs to just to protect yourself and your and your objects. No? Yeah, thanks, Michael, for having thrown this in. So you already can the the audience can see already what's going on and what I was here um, intentionally. This sort of we didn't uh, keep your uh, Halloween. This is the Halloween edition as well. We intentionally did not keep um, your costume because it might have been inappropriate for this time. But if you compare last week's show to this week's show, you can figure where it's going because you were the bearded guy until recently and now you're not anymore. And I was spontaneously making myself into that, uh, being the pineapple and Bundit who visited you yesterday made himself into the palm tree uh, with the leaves. And and this I, I got from Ethel yesterday. So the uh, the manager of, um, of the Breakers Hotel, where she is uh, working, managing it since 1954. And this was grown on uh, planter troughs uh, on the Lanais. And so, you know, this is, this is not weird. This is actually practiced, at least there. But the, the mainstream does not practice that, right? You need Yusin, who is the landscaping guy who has been doing this ever since with his father. So he grew up there and they like to, because the, the trees, again, the, the Soto you pointed out to us in this slide nine, if we can get that back, is the Ulu tree. This is all a Haina was, is gigantic groves of Ulu trees and Ulu trees are delicious fruit bearing that we have to talk about. Well, you also need to take care of them and when they, when they come down, you know, they can create a mess, but that's only in our Western mindset of everything needs to be clean and kind of, you know, sanitary. But if, if it's actually your food, 
you don't see it as something that's a problem. It's actually a blessing when the fruits come down because it means they're ripe. And, you know, I've once at Howard Wick up there at a party, you know, someone sliced them thin and, and roasted them. I never had that delicious chips. And that's just, you know, that's not even the, the basic food. You can make tons of stuff out of that. So that is uh, definitely, you know, that to be added in, into the scenario that's, uh, Martin, you use the, the term growing architecture as well, or it is a term that's out there, right? So um, we only have two minutes left, but we can start having slide 11. And then if you, the audience, already want to prepare for next week, uh, we will talk about going all the way up to 18 from, from 11. And that actually talks about from ground up. Slide 11 shares some of the fears again of, unfortunately, the soil being contaminated and being a problem. And it first needs to be dealt with. And uh, but your proposal, and this gets us to 12, which seems like almost, well, the slide is missing, is actually not talk about what we actually see uh, and, and talk about why we don't see much. And this is similar to Rainbow Drive again. Same thing, right? One minute left. <laughs> yeah. Uh, what what we can I mean, if we go to the following slide, is that these two cases on weather uh, similar, more or less, how and how, uh, to Hawaii, a little bit more humid, but tropical weathers. These two fantastic uh, projects uh, on which architects forgot shadow, basically. Uh, and what is happening here? I took those photos myself. Uh, and you see this the, right in the downtown of these huge cities. In the rush hour, there is no people. Uh, why? Because you cannot be there. Or only if you are an architect taking picture, pictures. Uh, so we have to, uh, uh, again, and we can uh, uh, take from there uh, uh, later, but uh, to provide open ground floors and, and covered uh, spaces for, for, for the public. All right, with that, hold that thought because that's where we pick up from next time again. And until then, please stay fantastically fundamental, fundamentally fantastic. See you next week. Bye.